Hello, this is Professor Matt Catrullis, and this is my video lecture on Chapter 12, which continues our look at organic chemistry by focusing on compounds which feature heteroatoms. And that will be the basic focus of both Chapter 12 and Chapter 13. Now, I have taught this subject out of a few different textbooks, and they always seem to split the chapters on heteroatoms up into two chapters, and to me it's never really made any sense. I honestly think that they are splitting these uh, just to keep the chapters from being too large. Uh, so if it kind of seems like there's no real distinction between chapter 12 and chapter 13, I would say you're correct. It's just that we feature different functional groups in chapter 12 than we do in chapter 13. Most of chapter 13 is going to focus on compounds which have carbon-oxygen double bonds in them, but for whatever reason it also includes amines, and this chapter includes aldehydes and ketones which do have carbon-oxygen double bonds. So don't look to me to figure out exactly why they chose to divide the chapters the way they did. Now in our different drawings of structures, particularly skeletal structures and condensed structures, it's a very common practice to leave off the lone pairs in the drawings. When we are trying to draw those into the figures using our computers, it, it adds a substantial amount of time to make the lone pairs look good. And so that is why I think we ultimately leave them out most of the time. They also can tend to clutter the drawing. Now, just because you don't see them on the structure, does not mean that they are not there. They are certainly there. So unless you see a notation otherwise indicated in this chapter and chapter 13, we're going to always follow the standard bonding rules, which means that nitrogen atoms will make three bonds and have one lone pair. Oxygen and sulfur atoms will make two bonds and have two lone pairs. And we will see that our halogen atoms make one bond and have three lone pairs. The first functional group that we're going to look at in this chapter are alcohols. Recall that alcohols are the functional group which contain a bond between a carbon atom and the OH group. That OH group is called a hydroxyl group, similar to the way we call an OH minus ion a hydroxide ion. They do, however, have totally different reactivities, whereas hydroxides are basic, alcohols are not. Now we're going to use a very useful system to categorize these alcohols that will come up as being very useful later on when we get into oxidation reactions, and that is that we categorize them based on the number of carbon atoms the alcohol carbon is bonded to. So here are three typical alcohols. The one on the left is identified as a primary alcohol, and that is because the carbon that is bonded to the hydroxyl group is itself only bonded to one carbon. The next one is a secondary alcohol, and again we'll see this carbon right here is bonded to two carbon atoms. And then finally, we have a tertiary alcohol where this carbon is bonded to three carbons. And importantly, it is not bonded to any hydrogens. The physical properties of alcohols, as well as those of essentially all the functional groups that we're going to be looking at today, are predicated on the types of intermolecular forces the molecules experience. Recall that there are three main intermolecular forces, hydrogen bonding, then the London forces, and in between those in strength we have dipole-dipole forces. Alcohols can generally engage in hydrogen bonding, and that's going to have a very uh, big effect on their boiling points, melting points, and solubility. If you don't remember much about hydrogen bonding, you'll want to go back and look at chapter four. Let's take a look at some examples of this hydrogen bonding within the compounds. So here I have two molecules of ethanol. I've got one here 
and 1 here. Recall, of course, that the straight lines stand for covalent bonds. The dashed line here stands for a hydrogen bond. And a hydrogen bond, again, is an intermolecular force. It is an attraction between two molecules. Recall that hydrogen bonding occurs between a hydrogen atom covalently bonded to phone, that is F, O, or N, and some other phone, so that is some other fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen atom. And so we have a nice strong attraction here between these molecules. Here I'm showing ethanol, hydrogen bonding, with water. So because hydrogen bonding is so strong of an intermolecular force, you need quite a bit of energy to separate alcohol molecules from one another. So when we look at alcohols, they tend to have quite high boiling points if you compare them with other molecules which have roughly the same number of carbons and the same number of oxygens. In other words, when they have similar molecular weights. So higher boiling points and higher melting points. Small alcohols, those with fewer than five carbon atoms, are soluble in water, particularly those with three carbon atoms or less. For compounds that have five or more carbons, their solubilities tend to be much more similar to alkanes. Hydrogen bonding tends to be less important for these compounds, and London forces tend to be more important ultimately because you have long carbon chains and recall that those nonpolar chains are generally associated with London forces. When we look at the nomenclature of alcohols, it's going to follow the same general pattern as what we saw for alkenes and alkynes with a few adjustments. And this is how nomenclature is going to work pretty much from here on out, is that we just look at a few small adjustments to the main rules. So, as before, we look for the longest hydrocarbon chain that contains the functional group, and we call that the parent hydrocarbon. And in that case, it's the carbon bonded to the OH group. That's going to be the one which is, uh, has to be part of the chain. We number the functional group, gets the lowest possible number. And if it's the same either way, as a tiebreaker, we go to the substituents, and we want the first substituent that we run into to have the lowest possible number. We change the ending of the name from ain to all, O-L. But in essentially all other respects, the naming rules are no different than they were for alkanes and alkenes. Now we're going to see it's starting with alcohols and moving on to some of the other functional groups that many of the compounds have common names and some of those you'll have to be familiar with as well. In most cases these make sense. So the names that you're going to see here in blue are the official IUPAC names according to the rules that we've learned and then the names in red are common names which are often used. So the first alcohol here is the really about the only alcohol that we'll see that is not primary, secondary, or tertiary in any way, because this carbon is not bonded to any other carbons. So if we have one carbon, that would be methane. That's the longest chain, but because it's an alcohol, it becomes methanol. We replace ane with all, so methanol. The common name for this compound is to just treat the methyl group as a substituent and then add the word alcohol. So this would be called methyl alcohol. How about here? The longest chain is two carbons. And you'll notice if I put the alcohol on this side, this would be carbon number one. Writing it on this side, this is carbon number one. So there's no way of putting an alcohol on here without it uh, being carbon number one, so we don't need a number for this particular compound. So just as this one was methanol, this one would be ethanol. And just like we used the name methyl alcohol as a common name, this would be ethyl alcohol. Adding another carbon would 
take us from ethanol to propanol. However, the alcohol could occur on the first carbon or it could occur on the second carbon as we see below and those have to have separate names. Is it possible to have three propanol? No, because if we put the OH here over on this carbon, then that would have been carbon number one. So there is no such thing as three propanol. And this is called propyl alcohol, or sometimes N, the letter N, propyl alcohol. This is a very important alcohol here. So it's propanol, but with the hydroxyl group on the second carbon. So this is two propanol. And this is often known as isopropyl alcohol or sometimes isopropanol. So this is just plain rubbing alcohol. Here we have an alcohol on a ring. This was a cyclopentane ring. So this just becomes cyclopentanol. There's no reason to number this because the functional group always makes whatever it's attached to carbon one. Uh, I haven't given you a common name here, but you could name this as a cyclopentyl group and call it cyclopentyl alcohol, but cyclopentanol is the name we'd be going for. And this, of course, would be cyclohexanol. For practice, I'm going to assign you here three compounds, which are a little bit more difficult than what we saw before. And I would like you to take some time, look at these compounds, and name them. So take a moment. Pause the video, and when you're ready to continue, go ahead and unpause, and we'll look at how to name these compounds. Okay, let's start with the first compound here in the upper left. So we're going to, first of all, identify the functional group, which is an alcohol. We have to find the longest chain here. And that longest chain has to contain that carbon. So the longest chain would be right here. And I could either go up or to the left. Probably easier if I just go to the left right there. And I want to number the chain so that we get to the alcohol uh, with the lowest possible number. So going from the right, one, two. If we go from the left, one, two, three, four, so it's better to have two. So the ending is going to be two, one, two, three, four, five, two pentanol. But there is a substituent, so we have to uh, put its name on in the front. So let's go ahead and number everything here. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. This substituent is a methyl group. So the name of the compound is going to be 4-methyl. 2-pentanol. Here we have an alcohol which is attached to a ring. Also attached to the ring is an ethyl group. So we are going to always number this for our ring such that the functional group gets the lowest possible number, uh, 1. So this carbon is number 1. And then we want to get to the substituent with the lowest possible number. So we'll number this one and then this carbon two. This is a cyclobutane ring, four carbon cyclobutane. It has a substituent on carbon number two. So this is going to be two ethyl cyclobutanol. Again, no reason to uh, number cyclobutanol because the functional group is always carbon number one. Let's take a look at the next compound here. So we want the longest chain which contains this carbon here. It's part of the alcohol so that has to be part of it. Uh, whether I go one two or down here one two makes no difference. So let's just go left to right. I come here and now I have to make a decision. If I go up, it's two carbons. If I go to the right, it's two carbons. So it's the same thing either way. All right, so let's go ahead and count those. And how many carbons do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that makes the parent heptane. 
we need to number so that we get to the alcohol with the lowest number. So that will be uh, here on carbon one, two, three. So we'll number it from the left. So heptane becomes three heptanol. And we have to add the substituents to the front of the name. So here on carbon three is an ethyl group. Here on carbon five is an ethyl group. So this will be three comma five diethyl and then three heptanol where the three is referring to the alcohol. We're going to take a look at one reaction of alcohols right now and we'll look at some others of a different sort a little bit later on in this chapter. This next reaction that we're going to see here is called the dehydration of alcohols. You should know that dehydration means loss of water. When we dehydrate an alcohol, we use sulfuric acid or phosphoric acid, but for right now we'll just use sulfuric. And what that will do is it will change the alcohol into an alkene. Now this reaction is exactly the opposite of the hydration reaction in chapter 11. Recall that the reaction in chapter 11 changed an alkene into an alcohol. So if we go ahead and look here at an alcohol, we have a carbon with the hydroxyl group on it. And on the adjacent carbon, there is a hydrogen. So we lose HOH. And we replace that with a double bond. An alkene. For this reaction to work, the neighboring carbon must have a hydrogen atom. So, for example, we could not do this reaction on methanol because if there's only one carbon, there can't be a next door carbon with a hydrogen for the dehydration to take place. And sulfuric acid here is going to act as our essential catalyst to make this reaction go quickly. So let's look at a couple examples here. So I'll start with this compound here, which is named what? Well, longest chain is three carbons. The alcohol is on carbon number three, either way you go. So this is three pentanol. And if we're trying to figure out what's gonna happen here, we lose the OH group and we lose either the hydrogen on one of the hydrogens on the left or one of the hydrogens on the right. You'll notice that either way it doesn't matter because you could call this carbon number two, one, two, three, or you could call this carbon number two, one, two, three. Uh, and that's why I picked this as an example. You're only gonna get one possible alkene here. So after adding sulfuric acid, that is going to give us two pentene plus water. Now, technically, I have drawn this compound uh, with the hydrogens condensed, and that's because in reality, you do get two compounds. What are they? Think about this for a second. Well, if there's exactly one hydrogen here and one hydrogen there, that means you can get cis and trans. So I haven't shown it here, but you can get cis-2-pentene and you get trans-2-pentene. Uh, what about this compound? This is cyclohexanol. So on the next door carbon, that would be either this carbon or this carbon, they both have two hydrogen atoms. Uh, and when you go ahead and you add sulfuric acid, that will cause a dehydration to occur. I just chose to pick one of the hydrogens off of the top here. I could have done it off of the bottom just as well, because in either case, the compound it gives me is cyclohexene plus water. The next functional group that we're going to look at is ethers. So ethers are functional groups which contain an oxygen bonded to two carbon atoms. By far, the most common ether is what is called diethyl ether. Uh, that name should make sense because we've got an oxygen with an ethyl group here and an ethyl group here. And incidentally, the common name of this compound is ether. 
So if someone is ever just talking about ether, they almost always mean this compound. Uh, what is the shape about this oxygen atom here? Well, the oxygen is making two bonds and has two lone pairs. So that would be the bent shape. And that is the same shape for water molecules as well as for alcohols. Now, what is the strongest force that we associate with ethers? Can they hydrogen bond? Well, they can hydrogen bond with water because water supplies its own hydrogen, which is bonded to oxygen. But what about if ether is just with other ether molecules? Well, none of the hydrogens are bonded to oxygen. So this cannot form a hydrogen bond with itself. All the hydrogens are bonded to carbons. So what's the next strongest force? Well, we have dipole-dipole forces. Does this molecule have a dipole moment? And indeed, it does. Oxygen and carbon do not share well. Oxygen is much more electronegative than carbon. So the electrons are being pulled up. This side is uh, electronegative, much has a partially negative charge on it. And these are more positive here. So dipole-dipole forces. Now compared to alkanes with similar molecular weights, do we think these are gonna have higher or lower boiling points? Well, think about this. If it was an alkane, then that would have had a CH2 there. That wouldn't even have dipole-dipole forces. That would only have London forces, which are generally weaker. So the intermolecular forces here are stronger than with alkanes, and so ethers should have higher boiling points and slightly higher melting points as well. What about if we compare ethers to alcohols. Hmm. Well, alcohols could make hydrogen bonds, and hydrogen bonding was a stronger force than dipole dipole forces. So, alcohol molecules are held together more strongly than ether molecules. So, alcohols should have higher boiling points, and we would expect ethers then to have lower boiling points than alcohols assuming they have similar molecular weights, meaning about the same number of carbons and or oxygens in their structure. Your textbook says that small ethers are soluble in water. However, that is really, in my experience, not entirely true. Uh, they are soluble in very small amounts. For example, if I took 20 milliliters of water and I mix that with 20 milliliters of diethyl ether, they don't look like they mix. You will see two very distinct layers between them. Now, it turns out quite a bit of the ether will hide in between the water molecules. So it does mix a little, but you won't be able to see that with your eyes, um, certainly not at first. So I would generally say that uh, your book's statement about saying small ethers being soluble in water, that's a kind of limited accuracy. Many of the small ethers are extremely flammable. Diethyl ether is notoriously flammable and can only be worked with safely in the complete absence of a flame source, like a Bunsen burner. We're not going to study any of the reactions of ethers in this class. They're not in the textbook. They are of a similar reactivity to alkanes in many cases. And we're not going to get far into uh, naming them according to the IUPAC rules. Uh, diethyl ether, for example, is a common name. The IUPAC name of it would have been ethoxyethane, but we won't worry about the IUPAC names. I do want to point out that sometimes we find ethers in rings uh, with oxygen replacing a, a, a carbon atom. So this is a particularly common solvent called tetrahydrofuran, abbreviated THF. You don't need to know this compound at all. I just wanted you to see that we can, in fact, replace a carbon with an oxygen, and that gives you an ether because there's a carbon on either side. 
So I'm going to end this video right here. And in the next video, we'll continue with looking at alkyl halides.